Resurrection Sunday to you. I hope you've been enjoying our services the last uh, couple of weeks uh, in uh, our YouTube channel. And looking forward to uh, the service this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. Let's uh, go ahead and start with song number 268, He Lives. We thank you for the day that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to uh, reach out and uh, through uh, digital technology to proclaim the gospel message, to uh, encourage one another, and even to, uh, to celebrate in a very special way your resurrection from the grave. Lord, I pray that you'd be with every person listening uh, this morning. I pray that our hearts would be stirred. I pray that we want to glorify you and want to rejoice in the fact that uh, our Savior uh, died on the cross so that people could be saved, so that we could have eternal life in heaven with him. And then he rose from the grave. Lord, help us to remember that as we celebrate this resurrection uh, weekend. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me make just a couple of announcements uh, now, uh, you can get your Bibles out, and uh, please uh, open them to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. We'll go over our memory verse after we make uh, some of these announcements. But first of all, uh, remember on Sundays now, at 10 o'clock, there's a Sunday school for children, and at 11 o'clock, there's the uh, main church worship service, both of those on the YouTube channel. Then uh, Teen Sunday School will be coming soon on uh, Zoom. 
Uh, remember prayer meeting uh, at Wednesday uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, right now, just be praying at home. Uh, remember those things we had been praying for. Maybe get a list uh, from Pastor or, or me or uh, Brother Wallace or Brother Ram. Uh, and we, of course, uh, may have a Bible study starting on uh, Zoom there as well soon. Make sure that we have your contact details, uh, email and mobile phone, so that we can get a hold of you and uh, announce uh, any special events or special uh, things that uh, you need to know about. Then remember to uh, keep giving uh, to the church and to uh, missions uh, of your financial support through online banking. Thank you for that that's already been uh, sent out and, uh, and given. We want to uh, mention that the church is going to give a special offering to uh, Vanuatu and uh, Tonga and our missionaries there uh, due to the effects of Cyclone Herald. So we'll have a special offering that uh, we're already giving from the church, and you're welcome to give extra to that as well. All right, we want to thank you again for the giving that you've already been doing uh, online. We'll go ahead and pray for those uh, offerings and uh, offerings that will be given uh, today as well. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to give. Lord, even though we can't uh, meet physically, we can give online, and we're thankful for those funds that have been given. We pray that you'd use them, Lord, to, uh, to be a blessing and a help uh, to the missionaries. Lord, and we pray that you'd uh, help us as we use the funds to pay the bills and pay the mortgage and uh, uh, other things, other expenses that uh, uh, come up here around the church. Lord, we just uh, thank you for those who've given. Thank you for the opportunity to give. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead now and uh, open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, if you haven't done so, and uh, verse 30. We'll go ahead and read this through twice. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. One more time. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. All right, let's go to uh, song number 237, At the Cross.
thank you for that. Pastor Shalabar, if you'll come at this time, thank you. Welcome to Shalhaven Baptist Church. Thank you, musicians. Thank you uh, for uh, the beautiful music that we've heard so far, the wonderful hymns. Thank you, Pastor Hall, for uh, leading those things and uh, taking care of things. Again, we meet together um, on this format on YouTube, and uh, it continues to be a little bit strange to me, and perhaps it is to you, as you sit at home or wherever you are, and listen in to the church service today. I trust it'll be a blessing to you. Why don't you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians and chapter 11 this morning. 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. I hope you were watching the Sunday school uh, earlier this morning uh, at 10 o'clock, the children's Sunday school with Mrs. Hall. You're going to love that. If you haven't watched it, you need to be in there watching that. It's terrific. Yeah, you kids will really enjoy that. I think even adults are going to like that. Amen. So I want to speak to you this morning about this passage of Scripture here, about the idea of the Lord's Supper, and the theme of my message this morning will be, do this in remembrance of me. Now, there are only two ordinances that we as Baptists recognise. Uh, the word ordinance means a law or something prescribed. Mr. Webster in his dictionary says that it's a rule established by authority. Now, Baptists recognise two ordinances as being prescribed by the word of God. The first is the ordinance of baptism by immersion and the other is the Lord's Supper, or we might call it communion or the, the Lord's table. Baptism is a symbolic act that uh, portrays what Jesus has done for the believer in salvation. It pictures a person dying to their old self, dying to sin and being raised again unto resurrection, being raised unto life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's an outward sign or a symbol of that which has already happened inwardly in our heart. You know, if you're a born-again believer, if you're saved and you haven't been baptised, then you really should be uh, and follow that ordinance, follow the leading of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was himself baptised by John the Baptist in the River Jordan all those years ago. So baptism doesn't save you. It's an outward expression of that which has already taken place. Amen. Now, the Lord's Supper, on the other hand, is a symbolic act that uh, calls to mind the death and the resurrection of our Lord, but also the promise of his return. And so as we think about that, um, when we take the bread and the cup, uh, which uh, our Lord uh, presented to us as his supper, we're remembering the day when Jesus Christ was crucified, the day when Christ was um, on the cross of Calvary and died there, shedding his blood to pay the penalty for our sin. What we remember is, of course, that on the third day, he rose again. And, of course, today we would call Resurrection Sunday, the day that we celebrate the rising uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ from the grave, his conquering of death and of sin. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of an eternal work that God did through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we would do on uh, a morning at church when we were having the Lord's Supper. The Bible doesn't give us any particular prescribed times for us to have the Lord's Supper. Simply, uh, um, the Apostle Paul records that when we do it, as often as we do it, we are to do it in remembrance of our Saviour. So this morning, because of the restrictions that are all about us, because of uh, all of those things uh, associated with uh, social distancing and COVID-19 and all of those things that you well understand by now, we're not able to meet together. 
if we were able to meet together, we would celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper was given as an ordinance to the local church. So it's not appropriate to uh, hold the, to have the Lord's Supper outside of the local church. Nevertheless, we can and we will remember the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, and what it means for us. So why don't you turn in your Bibles now? I hope you've had them open. At 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to read some verses here from you. I'm going to begin in verse 23. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'll start to read in verse 23. This is Paul speaking here. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, so whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if, it would, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest I'll set in order when I come. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we look this morning at the Lord's Supper, that which our Saviour Jesus Christ ordained for his church. Lord God, as we look at this, I pray that you'd help us to understand not just the ordinance of the Lord's table, Lord, but all the things that it means to us because of Christ. And Lord, today we pray that we would bless you that we would praise our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and that we would bring glory to your name. Now, Heavenly Father, for those at home, I do pray for them. And Lord, if there be any watching on who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, Lord, I pray today might be the day of their salvation. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. More than anything else, the celebration of the Lord's Supper is a time of remembrance. And that's why I, I said earlier that we're concentrating on this little part of the scripture here that says, do this in remembrance of me. And that's the thought that we should concentrate. It's the thought that we will consider over these next few minutes together. Allow me to share with you some facts regarding the nature of the Lord's Supper as we consider the thought do this in remembrance of me. The word to commemorate means to honour the memory of someone or something in a ceremony, to serve as a memorial to something. If the Lord's Supper is anything at all, it's a memorial. It's a time to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a time when we bring to mind the things uh, of the cross. It's a time when we consider the great love God had for us in sending his Son we remember all the things that God has done for us. And we commemorate his sufferings. In verse 24 and 25, you'll notice there that Paul writes of the broken body and the blood of Jesus. And both of these things speak of suffering and pain. When we take the elements of the Lord's Supper, we're to remember that Jesus Christ suffered horribly to save us from the burden of our sin. 
when we consider the, uh, the bread, the unleavened bread that we use and the fruit of the vine, uh, the grape juice that is, is there to remind us of those things, and that's what they are. They are symbols that help us remember. They're not actually uh, the body or the blood of Christ. They don't impart any particular special blessing. You're not saved by taking uh, the Lord's table. In fact, you should be saved before you take the Lord's table. We'll speak of that a little later. But here, as we think about the, the body broken for us and Christ's blood shed, we think of the suffering of Christ. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah spoke of his suffering in Isaiah chapter 52. I can't quote all of that for you, nor in chapter 53, where there are other things spoken about the suffering of our Lord. But in uh, verse 24 in Isaiah chapter 52, we read this. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man. It indicates that, uh, that uh, Christ's uh, body was, was damaged, was marred more than any man. We read in the scriptures that they plucked out his beard, that they placed a crown of thorns on his head, uh, that they had beaten him with a whip. He had had a terrible, brutal beating. He had suffered horribly. And when we read in Isaiah 53 verse 7, we read this, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth as he, brought, as he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. A lamb to the slaughter. Jesus' suffering was physical, but it was more than physical. Jesus' suffering was also mental. He was in great anguish over the things that were happening. You might recall, uh, those of you who know the scriptures a little, that uh, as Jesus prayed uh, with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible tells us this. Luke records, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Agony. Agony of soul and of spirit as the Lord, our Saviour, was preparing for that which he knew was going to happen and was going to be terrible. So we commemorate his sufferings. We also commemorate his sacrifice. The fact that Jesus Christ was in a human body, um, that he was God, yet he was man, now that's a subject for considering later on. It's hard to understand, but that's how it is. So the fact that he was, in fact, uh, had taken on the form of humanity as he came to redeem us speaks about the sacrifice that he had made, that he had left the glories of heaven to come to earth and live as a man and suffer all the things that men suffer, pain and agony and loss of sleep and, uh, and disappointment and and as the end of his life, that cruelty that was afflicted on him. God became a man and lived and died in this world to redeem the lost. He suffered shame, rejection, poverty, pain and death. In fact, the goal of giving himself as our sacrifice was his whole purpose in coming to earth. And if we read what he said to, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Bible says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, that was what I've come to do. I've come to seek and to save those that are lost, those that have no way in life, that have no God to follow, who are not following the Lord God. Actually, when we think back to that other great event in the, on the Christian calendar, to Christmas time, and we consider the birth of Christ, we'll be reminded, of course, that before Christ was even born, the angel came and made an announcement about him. Mark records uh, that, uh, sorry, Luke does, um, <laughs> get myself right here, Luke does um, record that that at his birth the angel announced 
and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And I still got that wrong because it's Matthew chapter 1. <laughs> ah, that's the problem with being nervous in front of a camera. <laughs> So prior to his birth, it was known that he would save his people from their sins. And Mark records that Jesus said this, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. And that's what we remember. That's what we recall and we think about at Easter time. Easter, the most important time, I think, on the Christian calendar. If it were not for the death, the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no such thing as a Christian church. There would be no Christianity. There would be no salvation. If we were to uh, uh, were able to commemorate and share the Lord's Supper together today, when the bread and the, uh, the fruit of the vine were passed around by our deacons, I'd ask you to stop and to remember what Jesus did for you, how on the cross of Calvary he shed his precious blood, he died to pay the penalty for your sins and for my sins too, of course. In fact, Christ died for the sins of the whole world and all they need to do is accept that. Believe on him and be set free from the penalty of sin and shame. The Lord's Supper is a commemoration. It's also a celebration, isn't it? A celebration. Now, to celebrate means to mark a special occasion or day by ceremonies or festivals. It comes from a Latin word which means to attend a feast. That's what we do, the Lord's Supper, a kind of feast. We celebrate, we're attending a feast, celebrating what Jesus did for us. Uh, there should be here a, a heart full of thankfulness, a gracious acceptance of the things that God has done for us. We should be happy, joyful within our hearts about what Jesus has done for us. If you're a born again believer today, if you're saved, if you truly are a Christian, then you have so much to be happy about. And today you should be rejoicing as you consider what the Lord has done for you. In our celebration, we can celebrate his compassion. Notice the words in verse 24, for you. These words remind us that Jesus did what he did and suffered what he did because he loved us, because he cared for us. And that great verse of scripture that we quote so often, and if you've been here at Shoalhaven Baptist Church over the years, you hear me quote it quite a lot. It's just an important verse of scripture in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that a wonderful word of, of scripture? Yeah. Doesn't that show us how God loves us, how he sent his son uh, to die for us? But I want you to think about another verse also. In John chapter 15, verse 13, John, John records that Jesus said this, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. If you put those two verses together and you think about it, Jesus Christ calls us his friends and laid down his life for us. He says we're his friends if we do that which he commands us to do. He willingly took our sins upon himself that we might be delivered from our sins and from the penalty of our sins. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's so important. Because 
Christ died for us before we had a chance to get ourselves sorted out. He didn't say, look, go get yourself sorted out, go and fix this problem, go and stop doing that, go start doing this, whatever it was, and then I'll talk to you. Oh, no. Christ said, I love you enough. You trust me, I'll forgive you now. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. So we can celebrate his compassion. We can also celebrate his conquest. What's not mentioned in these verses but is clearly implied is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. After his death on the cross, he rose from the dead. That's what Easter's about. Three days later, rising from the dead. You see, anyone could have died and many people have died since and before. But only Christ could have paid for our sins. Only Christ, through his death, could guarantee eternal life. Only he who had no sin of his own could possibly pay the price for you and I, who are quite sinful. Jesus guarantees us eternal life by raising from the dead. Jesus said one time, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Thank God. Because he lives, all those believe in him shall live also. Amen. Oh, I know we're, we're going to leave this earthly place and we're going to depart from here our body will go, but there is a spirit, there is a soul that lives on. What's going to happen? If you don't know about that, if you're not sure that there is a heaven and that you have a place in heaven, consider it this morning. Because as we celebrate his compassion and his conquest over death, we also celebrate his coming again. We're told when we observe the Lord's Supper that we are telling this world that we believe in Jesus Christ, his death, his burial and his resurrection. But also we need to be remembering his coming again. The Bible tells us in other places the Lord Jesus Christ will come for his saints. He will come again. The Bible tells us uh, that there'll be a time that we call the rapture, the catching up, uh, when the saints will go to be with him. And when we read the scriptures here, we see it in verse 26. There's a promise there. And if I, sorry, um, there's a promise in verse 26. Let's have a look. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, it is show the Lord's death till he come. Till he come. It's coming again. In John's Gospel, in, in uh, chapter 14, we read that Jesus said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He was talking to his disciples and to us who believe. And that promise is reaffirmed many times in the scriptures. You can read it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in particular. The promise of the Lord's coming. You know, right at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, in the second last verse there, in the, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 20, we read that Jesus said, Surely I come quickly. The Lord said he's coming again. He'll come again. He's coming for his saints and that truth we can celebrate today as we remember Christ's death, his burial and his resurrection, we also can remember his coming again. The Lord's Supper is a time for commemoration. It's a time for celebration, but it's also a time for contemplation. You know, what does that mean? What does that word contemplation mean? It means to think about something seriously, to think about something at length, 
to give it consideration, to contemplate. Sometimes we contemplate and sometimes when we should, we don't. But here we want to contemplate the things of God, contemplate, think about the things of the Lord's Supper that remind us of Christ. It's easy to see there's much to celebrate. When we understand the message of, of these verses of Scripture, we can also understand that the Lord's Supper is a serious time because there's some warnings here in Scripture. If you were to read the, the first verses in chapter 11, you'd discover that Paul is actually reprimanding uh, the Corinthian church for the manner in which they were having the Lord's Supper because they were just kind of making light of it and they were making it into a common feast. And in fact, it was so bad that some people were becoming gluttonous, some people were becoming drunken at the feast that they were holding together in the church. And Paul says that's not good. He said it's not right. So he gives them some warning and then that's why he laid out here in the early verses that we read in verse 23 down to about verse uh, 26, 27 here, um, he lays out the form, the way in which the Lord's Supper should be. This is a time for us to reflect upon the condition of our lives, upon the way in which we live our life. The Bible sometimes uses uh, the word conversation, our way of life, to be sure that we are all we need to be in regard to our relationship with God through Christ. And when we've got that right, then we can participate in the Lord's Supper. It's a time to contemplate our salvation. You see, in spite of all of their sins and all of the things they hadn't got right, Paul here writing to the Corinthian church is speaking to saved people. So when he uses those words, us and we, he's talking about himself and his fellow believers. Uh, he's giving details of a celebration, a commemoration that is for believers. It's not for the world at large. It's for believers. I mean, if you don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, if you don't believe he is the Son of God who died to pay the penalty for your sins and, and was raised again the third day and so on, and all of those things that Jesus is, what he says he is and did what he said he did, if you don't believe that, well, what's to celebrate? What's to rejoice in for you? It's for believers. And what we believe here at Shoalhaven Baptist Church and what we practice is what I understand that Paul is talking to the Corinthians about. Everyone present was invited to participate, but only if they've been warned of the consequences of their partaking in the Lord's Supper before they did it, to make sure that no one unworthily participated because there were consequences. Now, since neither you nor I really know or understand or can see into the heart of each person, we're urged individually to do some self-examination. Only those who are in close communion with the Lord are to participate. Those people should be saved, baptised believers who have a clear conscience regarding their sin. The Bible reminds us, so let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Purpose of examination is to include you, if you can. So if you were in church today, and if you were a Christian with a clear conscience regarding your sin, no unconfessed sin before God, which I hope that you are, then you should participate in the Lord's Supper. Otherwise, you should let the bread and the cup pass you by. If you are a Christian, that's fine. If you're not a Christian, then don't participate in the Lord's Supper unless 
you choose to trust the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Right then and there, you can quickly trust Lord, uh, trust the Lord and be saved. You can be made worthy to participate in this great celebration, in this commemoration. And we should commemorate our sanctification. That word unworthy that we read there, we're told that if we take this cup and this bread unworthily, we bring God's wrath upon our lives by not reverencing the Lord's body. In fact, the phrase not discerning the Lord's body has the idea of treating Jesus as the mocking and jeering crowds had treated him at the day of his crucifixion. They laughed at him. They, they cried for his, uh, his crucifixion. They treated him terribly. And we don't want to be doing that. It means that we treat his broken body and his shed blood as if they were of no value, of little consequence. The Lord is telling us to examine our own lives. We need to be sure that we're clean before we come to his table. When we partake of his table, that's the Lord's table. With an unclean heart, we need to be aware that there'll be a price to pay. In verse 30, we read that some are sick because of it and some are dead and others will be chastised. So what are we to do? The answer is in verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. We're to self-examine. We're to consider our own situation. We're to bring those sins that we have in our heart that are unconfessed. We're to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible is very clear that God will forgive us. The Apostle John wrote in his first letter, in chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there's sin that affects your relationship with God, you can deal with it. He promises he'll forgive you. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. That's why. It's serious. You may say, is it really that serious? Well, yes, it is. It's quite serious. We do not want to participate in the Lord's Supper unworthily. I would say to you it's serious enough that if you uh, find yourself uh, with unconfessed sin and you're not prepared to deal with it, don't participate in the Lord's Supper. Because you don't want to bring the wrath of God upon you. I really wish you could be here this morning. That we could be together to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. But this Easter, circumstances and situations have intervened to prevent that. But don't let social distancing keep you out of distance from our Lord and from our Saviour. Don't allow this present situation to keep you from remembering our Lord's sacrifice and all that he's done for you. One last thing. If you've never accepted the Lord's invitation to receive from him the free gift of salvation, then you should do so now. Because the Bible tells us God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are many opportunities in life to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is one. Who knows whether it will be the last opportunity you have. You can affect your salvation by simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by believing he is the Son of God, who came and paid the penalty for your sin and set you free from the burden of sin and death. You can save your soul with a simple, heartfelt and sincere prayer. 
repenting of your sin and accepting Jesus Christ as your Saviour. The Bible tells us, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Now you've probably noticed, as you've been watching me this morning, that in front of the pulpit there, there is uh, the elements of the Lord's table. You'll see the cup and the unleavened bread. The cup containing the grape juice and the unleavened bread, unleavened because sin, leaven, or leaven is a symbol of sin in the Bible and we wouldn't want sin to be involved in the Lord's Supper, would we? If you were here, about now I'd be asking the deacons to pass around these elements for you to receive and then to partake of it. But it's not so today. You're not here and I wish you were. Therefore, let these things, this, these symbols of the Lord's Supper be for you a picture, a picture of God's love for you, a picture of God's demonstration of his care for you, of his mercy upon you. And remember the Lord Jesus Christ. These elements picture those things, the Lord's Supper. Take that memory with you and do as Jesus asked us to do. This do in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we'll thank you today. Thank you for the Lord's Supper that you gave to your church and to the saints. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us today. Bless each one who hears and sees this message. Lord, that they might know Christ died for them. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Keep safe through this Easter time. Okay, thank you, Pastor Shalabair. Let's uh, close our service this morning. Let's go to song number 265. Wonderful song. I've been looking forward to singing it again this morning. 265, Christ Arose. <laughs>
hope you're rejoicing in the truth, the fact that uh, he did uh, arise from the, the grave. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. Let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer. Thank you, Pastor Shellebear. Thank you for uh, uh, Brother Brendan and the musicians that are here. Thank you for those who have been watching. Uh, keep in touch with one another. Keep praying for one another. And uh, make sure you let us know if we do not have your email or your mobile phone uh, contact details so that we can keep in touch with you. Uh, let's go out. Let's uh, rejoice in uh, our risen Savior. Let's let others know about him. Uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the day you've given to us. Thank you for the message, the, the close communion, the close walk that we can have with you. Lord, it starts uh, when a person turns to you for salvation from their sin. Lord, when a person is saved from their sin and from hell, from the lake of fire, they, they can begin a, a walk with you, uh, a life uh, with you that knows uh, no end, that goes on into eternity. Lord, help us to uh, uh, remember all that you've done for us. Lord, help us to, uh, to remember fondly your love for us. Help us to love you more and serve you more. And Lord, help us to walk closely with you as, as we remember uh, the teaching of the observing of the Lord's table and as we remember your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Help us to rejoice in all that you've done. Help us to remember it. Help us to love you for it. Help us to tell others about it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.